Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Wachowski, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today uh, to our event, Black Philanthropy from Jim Crow to Today. This event is sponsored by the uh, Nonprofit Management Program in the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. And I'm excited to have uh, today my colleague Tyrone Freeman join us in this conversation about his wonderful book on Madam Walker. Uh, for those of you who have had a chance to read it, I'm sure you'll be quite impressed with all that it covers. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, we do have a special treat for you tonight, which is a discount code for you to have an opportunity to purchase this afterwards. And so take a look in the chat for that code. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Tyrone Freeman. Uh, I first met Tyrone about 10 years ago and uh, really have appreciated um, the exchanges we've had over the years. We were colleagues at Indiana University and stayed in touch since then. And so it's a wonderful chance to um, bring his knowledge and experience here. Uh, Tyrone got his uh, BA in uh, English uh, and Liberal Arts from Lincoln University. So it's a historically black uh, college and university. And so we uh, know some HBCU fellows out there as well. So glad to see that connection. Uh, received his master's in adult education from Indiana University, a master's in urban and regional planning from Ball State University, uh, and his PhD in philanthropic studies from Indiana University, which is where he and I uh, first met. At that time, he had already been a development officer and was working at the associate, as the associate director of the fundraising school at Indiana University. And um, later became the director of the undergraduate programs. And so uh, really has been involved in advancing education uh, for um, undergrads really uh, first and foremost at Indiana University, but also engaging in conversation about the best approaches to do that uh, nationally. And so uh, he's been a, a, a scholar who's really been quite engaged even before this book came out. But um, this new book is really kind of, I think, allowed him to expand and broaden his, um, his reach in terms of uh, um, understanding and influencing uh, uh, understandings of philanthropy. So uh, Tyrone's been cited in a number of different places, uh, New York Times, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, USA Today, Time, Harvard Business Review, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review, Blavity, The Conversation, Black Perspectives, Philanthropy Women, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Advancing Philanthropy. So quite a few different places, both more specialized and, um, and also uh, greater overviews. And so um, it really is a pleasure to welcome someone who's both a, a scholar and practitioner and has had influence in, on both things, um, both scholarship and practice. And so at this point, I'd like to ask Tyrone to talk a little bit about some of the core uh, understandings of his book, uh, Madam C.J. Walker and the Gospel of Giving, and uh, I'll turn it over to him. Well, thank you very much, Greg, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I wanna extend my uh, deep appreciation um, to Columbia and to Greg and to Cindy and to all the colleagues who have helped to make this happen. Uh, thanks to all of you for showing up and for your time and, and attention this evening. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. Um, uh, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow is, is a labor of love. Um, and it's, it's a work that has allowed me to explore aspects of my own lived experience, which is where some of the inspiration comes from because I, I'm the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of Baptist preachers and first ladies. And so I grew up in the Black Baptist Church, which is a premier philanthropic institution. And um, so, so I grew up in this tradition of generosity, a tradition of giving and sharing and caring, where everyone around me uh, was doing something to help others. And everyone around me was very intentional in supporting each other. And yet, when I entered into the professional world of, of fundraising, where I regularly found myself the only African American in the room, I found myself in a space and a field that had no knowledge and didn't know what to do of it or, or what to make of it didn't even think, perhaps didn't think it existed. Um, but I knew that, that, that that's not true, that it's very real. Uh, I'm a product of it. So many people from my community invested in me and supported me in so many ways. And so years later, when I entered into my PhD program and I'm studying uh, and researching the history of philanthropy, it was very frustrating to just not see um, engagement with African-Americans and other communities of color as philanthropists. There's a whole lot that's been written about how they've been helped by other people. 
But when it comes to their own philanthropic agency, there were only bits and pieces here and there. And so uh, kind of the book is an effort to try to bridge this gap, um, this lived experience of knowing it's real and knowing it, it's, it's there and it's been a powerful part of the Black experience from the beginning, um, but also these professional spaces of philanthropy that have, 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 have neglected it and haven't seen it. Um, and so that's really where it was, you know, kind of born in that, in that gap. And I, I look at it as a way to um, challenge some of the definitions in the field, challenge who counts as a philanthropist and what counts in philanthropy. And I'm particularly excited because Madam Walker became the perfect vehicle for doing this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much indebted to Alilia Bundles, who is Madam Walker's great, great granddaughter. Um, she blazed the trail. Um, I hope she's on tonight. I know she was gonna try to be here, um, but she blazed the trail through her, her award-winning best-selling biography. And, and so um, I wanted to find out more about not Madam Walker, the millionaire, or not Madam Walker, the entrepreneur or, or the business mogul, but Madam Walker, the giver, Madam Walker, the philanthropist. And, and I wanted to do more than just kind of highlight the popular gifts, the $1,000 to the YMCA that has gotten a lot of attention. Her will gets a lot of attention. I really wanted to know what was behind that. Where did it come from? Uh, what was she trying to do? How did she give? Um, and, the, and what did she give? And so those were the guiding questions that led me into the archive. And, and one of the challenges that I quickly learned it was that, um, again, there wasn't much in the existing literature that could help me ground what I was seeing in the archive. There's over 200 boxes of Madam Walker's papers here in Indianapolis, and now they're digitized, but for me they were, and for Lilia, they, they were not. You had to go through by hand. Um, and so finding lots of, 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 of gifts and, and, and ways of engaging in the struggle for freedom and equality. Um, but, but, but the existing philanthropy literature and ways of thinking about this wasn't giving me lenses to engage. And so, and this is where I've got a hashtag cite Black women, cite a sister. Um, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to many Black women's historians because while the history of American philanthropy has ignored Madam Walker and women like her, and the history of women's philanthropy has ignored Madam Walker and women like her, Black women's history, and Black women's historians have been writing about Walker and her peers for generations and, 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 and had ways of thinking about uh, who they were and what they were trying to do. Um, but interesting enough, that most of them do not cast uh, Madam's work in terms of philanthropy. So there was an opportunity for, for, for me to bring in a philanthropic studies lens uh, and blend that with a Black women's historian lens and an Africana studies lens to really look at how philanthropy was developed in this tradition by and among African Americans. And so the interesting conversations occurred. I, I went to conferences uh, with Black women's historians and Africana studies scholars and, and blessed to be in conversation with them and in fellowship with them and doing panels and having people read chapters and, 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 and being in lots of just uh, lots of great scholarly conversations about this. And, and so what has emerged was this gospel of giving, uh, which is my articulation, again, of how she gave, what she gave, and the context in which she gave. And so, and it is in that process that I'm challenging the, the traditional definitions. I'm challenging our thoughts about who counts as a philanthropist and, and looking at this idea that yes, she was a millionaire and yes, she was, was very wealthy, but generosity is a thread throughout her life. Uh, and that starts when she's this poor, orphaned, widowed, struggling single mother um, in St. Louis. And she's embraced by the St. Paul's African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and, and, and the women of that church in particular uh, embrace her and support her and, and, and really socialize her, kind of are arguing in the book, into Black women's ways of giving and, and ways of engaging. And, and so um, that's not limited to money. Sarah reports, her, her birth name was Sarah Breedlove, uh, Madam Walker reported that it was in those early days in, in St. Louis that she first really became aware of her responsibility to others and began practicing it. And so we see a sincere interest and effort in giving and engaging and, 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 and participating in the struggle for freedom uh, from, her, from her early years. And it's something that grows and evolves over time. And so this, this gives us a different way of thinking about it because we're used to raising up 
uh, philanthropists who who spent their lives accumulating wealth and then later in their elder years become serious about philanthropy and focus in on it. And, and we're used, even when we look at women, we're used to highlighting women who tend to inherit that wealth um, from husbands or fathers or, or other you know, family members and, and then become philanthropic. But this is different. Those, those models don't speak to Madam Walker. She, she didn't wait. Um, she gave along the way, as I say in the book, uh, which is a different mode of giving. And, and she certainly had no one to inherit the money from. She was, she was building wealth and giving along the way. And so fundamentally different approaches and, and different viewpoints that just weren't being spoken to by the prevailing models of her day, nor the ways that we think about it today. And so the book became an opportunity to address historic definitions of philanthropy and also to lay the foundation for, for, the, for the framework, uh, for, for, for the landscape of, of Black generosity today because um, I show in the book how I, I call Madam Walker a foremother of this tradition. She didn't create it, right? It was something that she was socialized into. So she was taught it by the Black women, her elders, her peers. But, but many people around her were doing the same thing. Um, and so I, I argue in the book that if you want to look for Black philanthropists, Black women philanthropists, don't necessarily look for that term. Look for club women. Look for church women. Look for fraternal women, look for the educators. These are the daily on the ground philanthropists who are actively pursuing a vision for their community, a vision of freedom and liberation and, and pulling together resources to try to do that. And, and, and it's an all hands on deck approach. It's not limited to money. Money's a part of it, but they're using their voice to speak truth to power and to, to advocate uh, against lynching and, and for, for women's voting rights and, and for, for temperance and other leading issues of the day. Um, and, and they're building schools to provide education in a Jim Crow context that is denying Black folks ad adequate education. And, and they're building companies. I argue that Madam Walker's doing social entrepreneurship 100 years before becomes this B-school buzzword because she really saw the company as a, I like to say, a FUBU company, a for us by us, right? This, this race company that was intended to provide economic opportunity for African Americans in a Jim Crow context where the labor markets were locking them out of meaningful and gainful employment or locking them in to you know, low wage uh, 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 labor where there was no opportunity for growth and, and taking care of their families in a meaningful way. But you could become a Walker agent and 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 have have a salary and have an or, or or have make commissions off your sales rather and 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 be able to take care of your family, um, and so so there's there's this economic development aspect to it as well that challenges notions of the role of business in philanthropy, um, that in this African American tradition and fight for liberation we had to use all institutions we could to push this fight and so I argue that her company uh, becomes kind of a third C along the club alongside the club and the church to push forward um, the, the press for freedom and liberation. So um, the book, uh, you know, is, is an effort to try to bring together this articulation of her philanthropy um, as a way to understand um, African Americans as agents uh, and not just recipients of other people's philanthropy and, and a way of, of trying to bring to the fore, right, this long-standing historical deep-rootedness of Black generosity. Because again, it didn't start with Walker, it predated her, and it even goes back uh, across the Atlantic, back the Middle Passage to pre-colonial Western Africa and, and, and cultural traditions of ways of giving and sharing and looking after each other that were transplanted to, to, to Southern plantations uh, through the slave trade. And so it's important to understand that and allow that to shape our understanding of Black philanthropy today, where it's, it's still vibrant, still engaged, certainly happening in the church and in sororities and in fraternities and in clubs. Uh, those same club women and church women are active uh, today, uh, the backbone of those institutions. Um, and, and also, the front line of the Black Lives Matter movement, the front line of the Me Too movement, um, the front line of the political activism that shifted the election um, in, in this past cycle, right? So, so all of this is part of this long-standing tradition of Black women's engagement. And so Walker became the perfect lens for highlighting that and sharing elements of that and bringing it to the fore. So, so the book is laid out in six chapters and each one is named for a different type of gift that she gave um, and, and explores the implications of that gift for again, expanding and challenging definitions of philanthropy, um, challenging um, the history of women's philanthropy to do more than focus on white women, but expand to other women of color in different ways of, of giving and engaging and really 
dealing with this idea that that philanthropy doesn't come from wealth, that philanthropy comes from generosity, that it, it was Sarah Breedlove's widow's might that 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 gave rise to Madam Walker's millions. And, and so it, it's something that grew over time with her and not something that only started on her deathbed in her 34 room, $250,000 mansion in Irvington, Hudson, New York, where, where a, a, a nearby neighbor was John D. Rockefeller. It didn't start there for her. It started back when she barely had anything. And, and, I, and I think that's inspiring for all of us. I think that speaks to the way in which anyone can give based on this tradition. Um, and, 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 and given the challenges that we all face today, uh, I think Madam Walker's the kind of philanthropist that we can draw um, some inspiration from and, and, and look at her model at how we might give of ourselves and what Ever we have, because because few of us will ever reach Carnegie's level, or you know that that's just not our story, right? So this is very much a philanthropy for the rest of us, I argue, because it's accessible. It doesn't matter that she was a millionaire, because that's not what it's about. It's just about that core generosity, that core sense of responsibility to others, and having that moral imagination and desire for a better society, pushing back against Jim Crow, fighting for gender justice, um, really, and, put, and challenging America to live up to its creed. Well, thank you, Tyrone. I, I, I think, um, you know, in that um, description, you, you can hear so many things that come out um, that are, are so important about this book. And so um, we're going to go through some of them. But I, I just want to start with the, the one piece that you kind of started with, which is um, the notion that uh, Black philanthropy has been left out of the history of philanthropy or, or was for quite a while. And how do, um, you know, what that meant, you know, and so in terms of uh, representing it by the John D. Rockefellers of the world and the like, um, what that kind of meant about our understanding of philanthropy. And, and, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about what you're talking about here is that th this blurring of lines that we talk about today, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, really, uh, it was blurred before in Madam Walker's day, right? So uh, can you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Yeah. Um. You know. And, and you're right. That that blurring. I mean, it. There was no luxury. Well, first, right. Our, our our contemporary understanding of three sectors. Right. That didn't really come until the Filer Commission. Right. So. So really, it's 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 a whole different context. And it's this idea of use whatever you have. Um, to deal with this situation, because you know we we tend to think about philanthropy and nonprofits existing because of gaps and right the three failures theories either the, the markets can't make a profit so they won't do it or the government can't get the median voter aligned so it won't do it so these nonprofits and philanthropy comes in but but what happens when the the, the government it's a different kind of government failure that the government is intentionally creating these conditions and these policies that make life difficult and that hold people back and are literally killing them? What happens when the private markets are complicit in, in, in constraining people and not giving them access and locking them in, right? And then our own beloved nonprofit sector is complicit because white social service agencies wouldn't take Black children or wouldn't serve Black elderly, right? So what do you do when the so-called three sectors are all collaborating and colluding against you, right? Um, you, 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 you turn inward and, and you do for self and you do what you can. And so that's why there's this long history of, of, of people using their churches, using their clubs to build schools and, 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 and daycares and, and trainings for parents and families and, and, and doing whatever they can, pulling together the resources to try to meet those needs because the whole of society is acting against them. And so it's important to recognize that you miss that, you know, and so you, you miss even your whole theoretical constructs are missing a, a, a basic understanding of how these things evolve. It's not all the same. And so I think it's important to, 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 to ask those kinds of questions and keep pushing. And one of the things I write in the book is that, you know, on the one hand, you cannot study African-American philanthropy without encountering their philanthropy, but it's so unfortunate that you can study American philanthropy and not encounter African-Americans. That has to change. And, and I think it's, it's following the trails. Um, it, it's, it's, it's looking at these, these, these people, these institutions, um, and how they were used to, to meet communities' needs and to push back against systems. This is not just charity work in the sense of 
um, uh, you know, I get the, the critics will say the impulsive, emotional based, um, immediate relief of somebody suffering in a moment. Madam Walker did that, but she also was collaborating and working as a part of networks to push back against that Jim Crow system. And so we see the full range of philanthropic activities and behaviors in her life and in the community that she's from, which is why I didn't want the millionaire status to separate her. I wanted to put her back into the community context and say, this is where she came from. She came out of networks of generous women, and she in turn became a generous woman and joined the fight uh, to push back against Jim Crow. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, I think the, um, the piece that stands out to me, too, is one of the reasons you separate out perhaps philanthropy or the nonprofit from um, the, the corporate sector is, mm. you know, people were a bit more embarrassed about how they made their money, right? Some of these other big, uh, big time philanthropists, whereas uh, for uh, Madam Walker, it was really part of what she was doing, right? It was an integral part to, to social advancement. And, you know, I, I think as we're um, entering into this period uh, of COVID in which, you know, we're talking about some of those things you mentioned uh, on a broader level, government's not doing it, business isn't doing it. There's really a turn towards uh, looking at mutual aid again. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things you talk about the washerwoman teaching that, and, and it has this long tradition um, you know, are there lessons from Madam Walker's life about mutual aid and how we can apply that to today? And, and Absolutely. Yes. And in fact, I, 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 um, I, I like to talk about how, how uh, Pamela Walker Laird is a historian who's coined a term that I think is, is very useful for understanding Madam Walker. She, she's labeled as the first self-made female millionaire. And, and, and there's a whole story behind that. There, there, there were others, and, but she's, she's, her, her wealth is very documented, um, the best documented that we have. right? But, but this idea of self-made, that, that, that's not a Black construct. That is something that was created for, for white men of the era and how they saw themselves. African-Americans actually had their own version of the gospel of success. And it included um, some, some material progress, but it was also embedded in a notion of freedom and liberation. And so when we look at what Madam Walker was doing and how she came out of networks of women, I, I think that Pamela Walker Laird's term of being mutually made is more appropriate than being self-made. And, and not, not knocking Madam Walker's moxie or determination at all, because she worked hard and, and she she did do things that that it's still inspired to this day. But I think it's important, again, to put her back into that community context. She came out of networks of women. She in turn created new networks of women and launched even more another movement through her agents to push back against Jim Crow. And so she was she was a washerwoman. She started working in her early teens as a washerwoman. And, and as I began to look again, these black women's historians who had looked at washerwomen just learned that these women, um, you know, weren't just kind of menial, low wage laborers that they were pillars of their community. Even the father of, of Black History Month wrote a beautiful article about Black washerwomen after Reconstruction um, in, 19, in the 1930s. Um, and he just, you know, they were just laying out how they were pillars of the community. They would give to charity. They had mutual aid strategies looking after each other, watching each other's children. Some of them even washed their clients' clothes together to get some economies there, right? Um, and, and, and so all of this is, is important. And some of them formed washing societies to advocate for wage protections uh, when, when and clients would stiff them. And, and then they were very successful in places like Galveston, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia, and getting those protections. So, so for her to have been a washerwoman, right, and, and to kind of likely to have been exposed to that or have some experience with that, it makes sense. And if people may remember in, in the late 1990s, another Black washerwoman made headlines, Osceola McCarty, right, that's another woman who you wouldn't suspect uh, would be philanthropic based on the stereotypes or a limited definition. And yet she, she, she gives a significant gift to a university that would not have even admitted her during her, her heyday. So, so I think it's important to understand that, that generosity. The club women, the church women, also gener generous, right? Um, the, the might missionary society in, in the African Methodist Episcopal Church was this a powerful vehicle that Black women used in that church to assert themselves within the church and outside into the community, performing a whole range of social services um, and meeting the needs. And this is particularly important um, in the lead up to the Black migration, because part of the reason why Sarah is able to 
kind of get 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 settled in in St. Louis. I mean, she, her brothers are there and there's family there. But the church for over a decade had been receiving the early exodusters that Nell Irvin Painter has written about, the, the first waves of Black folks that began moving westward and out of the South, seeking freedom and opportunity. But the church and, and the women's clubs had created this network to receive Black migrants and to help them because the St. Louis city government wasn't doing it. So again, I mean, it's important to understand the origins of these things and how they have evolved and how they're vital parts of the ways in which people have survived and a vital part of, again, this ongoing struggle for freedom today. Yeah, it's, um, you know, amazing legacy when you think of that. And, and um, you know, it, it reminds me a couple of things of, you know, community and how you define community. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, her national network and how she always kind of had that national perspective and even international, um, you know, your book mentions that. Um, but she also had a, a very much a local connection, whether that was St. Louis or Indianapolis or uh, eventually um, Harlem. And so can you talk a little bit about those local connections too? Sure. So, um, so St. Louis is is a, a big part of her story because that's, that's really where Sarah begins transitioning into Madam Walker, if you will. Right. This is where the the again the, the poor struggling orphaned widowed single mother right gets her feet. Right. She she she's able to kind of bounce back from those early tragedies and those early difficulties in this community that's embraced her and supported her. Now she's still struggling. There's still some challenges there, but but she's 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 in a different place. And and I talk about the power of the AME Church here um, because she becomes a member and. One of the things that she does every time she moves to a new city is quickly connects with the local AME church. Um, and it's important to understand that dynamic. Um, I love the way um, Imani Perry from Princeton talks about the, the black formal culture of voluntary organizations, that they had internal ways of being that weren't about the white gaze. It, it was how they wanted to comport themselves and how they developed their own values and transferred those to their children using songs and rituals and dress and, and recitations and plays and all these things. And, and so when you think about the black formal culture of the AME church. There's a, there's a culture of literacy, there's publications, they're speaking truth to power, they're building schools in the United States and overseas, right? They're doing a lot of things. They're, they're one of the institutions that's on the leading edge for the struggle for freedom. And so imagine coming into this black run institution, black people in the pulpit, black people in the pews, it's fully funded by black folks and, and, and they're doing big things in the world. That, that gives you a different sense of possibility than, than Delta Louisiana where she was born did on, on a cotton plantation. And so it's important to understand you know, those kinds of elements. So St. Louis is important. And, and later she would say that you know, she, she gave in remembrance of the kindness shown to her daughter there by the women of the church. Um, Indianapolis is important because um, she's only there for six years, but it really is, is a place where she puts down permanent roots. It's a place where she builds the first factory for the company. She incorporates the company in Indianapolis. Um, and, and, and she develops the kinds of friendships and relationships that endure. Um, I, I tell the story of Freeman B. Ransom in the book, um, who was her, her right-hand man, um, a Black man who had studied law at Columbia, uh, and, 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 and he, he helped to, to organize um, her vision and to implement it. And, and I talk about him as kind of being her program officer, if you will, or her, her philanthropoid, that he's, 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 he's fending off kind of, um, you know, suspect uh, uh, solicitors. Um, he also is, is being mindful of her wealth and trying to help her steward that. And he's, he's, he's managing some of these relationships with organizations too. Um, but, but the Ransom family and her family, very tight. And, and even to this day, um, in addition to Olivia Bundles, a pl uh, very pr uh, privileged to meet uh, Judith Ransom Lewis who is a descendant of Freeman B. Ransom. And they grew up together and they're, they're best friends to this day. So, so those relationships still exist to this day and are part of, of this incredible legacy. And so Indianapolis, the headquarters of the company was there. Um, the building uh, that the, the headquarters were in for, for, for decades still exists. It's now the Madam Walker Legacy Center, of, you know, doing a lot of arts and cultural programming, lots of things going on there. And then of course, Harlem. Is important and and um, she 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 left Indianapolis for New York and she had property in Harlem. Um, there's a street named for her and her daughter there now and and um, you know she would move out to Irvington on Hudson uh, where her mansion was, but she had she had property in in Harlem and that became a, a, an important spot for the Harlem Renaissance and her daughter became a, a big figure um, in, in the Harlem Renaissance and people like uh, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and all hanging out and all these parties and and again a little 
Alilia Bundles is currently writing the biography of Madeline Walker's daughter, um, Alilia Walker Robinson. And so we're all excited for that to see what she's going to share and uncover with us here to, to see how the legacy continued with that very next generation. So, so, so St. Louis, Indianapolis, New York, those are all places that are important. And also there's, there's an argument to be made that New York puts her on in a different stage with all the things going on in Harlem. Um, this is where, you know, that she's meetings with, with Adam Clayton Powell Sr. And, and Du Bois and Marcus Garvey and others. So, so very much kind of moving into a, a next level, if you will, too, um, for, her, for her brand, for her reputation, and for her engagement in the struggle. It's during that time that she begins to become more international. She had done some earlier trips to places like Cuba, um, but she begins to think again, as Black folks were doing during that time, about uniting with other people of color around the world who are dealing with colonialism and its impact on, on their lives and their communities. Yeah, thank you. It, it's, um, you know, one of the things that, um, that struck me also in reading through, and, and, I, and I like so much how you name the different chapters for different ways in which um, you know, she was generous, mm -hmm. um, but was the mix of activism and sort of challenging um, the system, right? Which in itself was just so um, revolutionary in its own way, uh, but the means were often uh, more traditional in the sense of, okay, let's support education, let's support you know, those kind of self-help means that um, you could have seen Carnegie or another uh, type of philanthropist um, engage with. How do you see that conflict uh, sort of playing out between, and, and you know, we can see this to some extent today too, right, of, of a call for a change and a challenge to a, a, a system that's been uh, unjust, um, but, you know, still kind of feeling around and trying to rely on some of those means that we're, we're familiar with and used to. Yeah, well, so I think, well, so let's take education. So one, Madam Walker created her own network of beauty schools. And so I talk about in the book how that becomes a vehicle for her philanthropy, because education is, is a core part of Black philanthropy. And I argue that education itself is, is a gift in this tradition, uh, because again, it's something that's being denied, or, or it's being very strictly confined, right? And, 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 and it's being done in a way that, that that leaves out and that that kind of prepares people um, to be oppressed and to be a part of the Jim Crow system rather than to break free. Think about the miseducation of the Negro and Carter G. Woodson and all, all those kinds of things, right? So for her to build a network of schools where you could come get a credential and begin working for her company or hang up your own shingle and do your own, that, that provides a different kind of, of opportunity, right? Um, and also she engages her agents in that struggle. So, so I, I, I argue in the book that she out Tuskegee Booker T. Washington in that um, he was very focused on keeping Black folks in the South, wanting to be a part of the agricultural economy, not really acknowledging the change, the industrial change that's happening. And yet Madam Walker has this way of integrating people into these Northern industrial economies through beauty culture that puts her in, in stark contrast. So, so I, I think that that's one thing. The other thing too is that she had a very different relationship with her, her sister educators um, than, than Carnegie or, or Rockefeller or others, right? And so there's a whole, you know, the, 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 the education historians have done a whole lot of work on, on the ways in which the General Education Board and the Carnegie Foundations and the Slater Funds and all, and, and the control and, and, and the ways in which they were using their gifts to, to maintain the status quo of Jim Crow, not upset the South, maintain their business interests, keep Black folks in their place. People have gone through the board minutes and seen the horrible things that, that the trustees were saying about Black folks, right? And, and yet, Madam Walker is coming at those schools in a different way. She becomes an equally prized donor, equally sought after, but she's not doing that dance. She's not making them kind of jump through those kind of hoops. She's not really asserting that kind of control. And I argue because of her own proximity to it, that, that she knew. Uh, she, she, she lived with the, the idea of not being formally educated, right, because that wasn't provided for her, right, and so she had a different relationship, and she also knew how people like Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune would take money from the white philanthropists and say, yeah, yeah, we're doing industrial education, and then go over here and go do the classical things that they really wanted to do because they had, a, they had a, a, another curriculum that they wanted to give to their children to prepare that generation. And this is important, too, because it's, it's again, I love Imani Perry's work, but one of the things that she argues in her book about May We Forever Stand, the Negro National Anthem, is that the civil rights movement is not um, 
only something that happens in, in the 1950s, but it's it's actually the culmination of generations of, of, of people who, who kind of, of children who kind of grew up uh, under this black formal culture where they were taught to struggle, taught to fight, taught it was their responsibility. And so when things take off, that generation is there and ready. And so it's important to think about, again, during Madam Walker's lifetime, the NAACP, the Urban League, all the Divine Nine, these, these organizations are founded during this time. And, and it's her kind of giving to them, other people from the communities giving to them and supporting them that really set the stage for them to be on, on base and ready to go when, when the civil rights movement, as, as we tend to think about it, um, really takes off in earnest. So um, I, I think it's, a, it's a critical to look at, she had a different kind of relationship with the organizations that she was funding that, that didn't have the same types of politics and tension as the white philanthropy to black organizations did. Yeah, it's always interesting the um, you know the subversive nature of the uh, uh, of the grant recipient, right? <laughs> to, to take right. the money and, and do what they've always intended. <laughs> so, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, appreciate that um, explanation. And uh, you know, so I, the one other piece that I, I find interesting, and, and you know, you mentioned this has been quite studied in terms of Walker, but actually not so much studied by philanthropy scholars generally is the quest mm -hmm. and what it means in terms of separating out a bequest versus, you know, her giving while earning, um, you know, what she was seeking to accomplish in the two different um, means of giving. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, what you're doing while you're living and earning again in, in, in Walker's uh, sense versus what you're doing as, as kind of legacy building perhaps in terms of a, a bequest. Yeah, so so well, there's a chapter called Legacy, which is all about really the construction of her will. And so I do this analysis of the will and look at the ways in which she she uses the will to assert her identity as, as a God-fearing businesswoman, uh, race woman, uh, mother, uh, and someone engaged and committed to the struggle and to her people. And, 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 and looking at the conversations she has with her attorney while she's constructing it, the things she's concerned about, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting because she ends up up making provisions not only for charitable organizations, but also for uh, people in her lives beyond her family, that she left money to um, employees, she left money to friends and neighbors. Um, she, she left money and property um, to family members. Um, and so you see her kind of taking care of people in the ways that she was trying to do while she was alive. Uh, but again, there's this kind of this message again of how she wants to be remembered. And so um, it's, it's really, and it's also to think about again, she's doing this at this transitional period. I'm looking at some of the, the history of wills and that it wasn't really common for, 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 for women to kind of assert wills at this time, let alone black people. And and again, think about that trans transition. You know, she she comes from a people who used to be property, and now she's making provisions to distribute her property, right? So there, there's there's a whole lot of things that are going on at play there. And so how she wanted to be remembered was very important. So I kind of tell the story of, of, of that will and how it plays out. Um, and, in, and to me, it's really interesting because we, we, today we pretty much are remembering her the way <laughs> that she kind of laid out. And, and it's important to note that kind of each generation has picked up her story and run with it and done something with it. And, and um, you know, there was an African-American soprano um, named Ravella Hughes who sang about Madam Walker in her shows in the 1930s. And, and Duke Ellington wrote a, a play about her. And, 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 you know, most recently the Netflix series and, and, and of course, Olivia Bundles has been out there doing things for, for decades about, about Madam Walker. There's all types of regional plays and community plays about Madam Walker. So, um, that, that legacy is powerful and, and people get the legacy of giving too. So I just wanted to kind of bring more of the full story behind that um, so that they have more context for it. That's great. Yeah. It's, um, you know, in terms of uh, legacy, it's, it's uh, when you can plan it and, and have people follow it. That's, uh, <laughs> you got to be happy with that. Right? So um, you mentioned, you know, we're all basically, um, giving while earning, right? We're all sort of uh, in that place. Few of us are gonna be the Carnegie's of the world. Few of us are gonna be the walkers of the world, right? I know, I know you used to like to uh, say she was the, uh, not the Oprah of the day, Oprah is the walker of today, right? So uh, <laughs> it's a very, uh, it's a small group that would include people like that. Um, nonetheless, I mean, uh, this notion of kind of uh, looking at large donors versus, um, versus sort of everyday donors, which, you know, I think you do a nice job of situating Walker in that everyday donor um, tradition, even as she has, of course, given uh, larger sums in her life. Um, 
What does that mean in terms of uh, embracing that sense of kind of, uh, you know, a giving while earning approach for fundraisers? And, you know, are there uh, elements to understanding uh, Black philanthropy and the tradition of Black philanthropy that um, fundraisers should uh, embrace, recognizing, of course, there are lots of traditions within that. But, um, right. you know, wondering if, if there are elements of that you could speak to. Yeah, sure. So um, at the end of the book, I, I talk about the, um, the Smithsonian's campaign for the National Museum of African American History and Culture and how it, it, I saw it as a representation of this tradition that Walker you know, represented because, yes, they had the lead gifts from, from, from Oprah and Robert F. Smith and, and uh, David Rubenstein and the Gates and all those. They did all that. Um, but they also were very intentional about uh, creating multiple pathways for engagement, particularly at the entry level. Um, and so they ended up with over 100,000 people giving at kind of that entry level that started at $25. And, and they even played around in the middle um, uh, with, with gifts of $5,000 to $20,000 and, and broadened their base by, by creating more incremental approaches to giving and allow, you know, instead of um, looking for people who could flat out give $25,000, say who could give five over five years, uh, you know, five a year or over five years. And, and they were blown away by the response. They ended up with over 1,000 people giving in that middle middle level, and many of whom are still active and engaged. There's a whole vibrant programming that goes along with that. But, but they were very intentional and, um, you know, um, about the organization of that campaign, the African-American fundraisers um, who were, who were central to that, um, had a chance to talk with some of them for this. Um, it's just, it was just really a powerful example of that. But then also when you see the connection that it wasn't just the monetary, right? That they had so many people that wanted to volunteer, they, they had to temporarily shut down kind of the list um, because people caught the vision. And, and this was a chance, right? That, that there was a, a culturally relevant case for support. Um, it was a powerful project. They wanted to be a part of it. Um, and, and so, and if you've ever been, I had a chance to take my family, the, the docents are just so proud proud to be there. It's, it's a beautiful experience. And, and, and many of them, the day I was there, most of them were, were, were African-American senior citizens. And, and they're there to, to, to direct you and point your way, explain something, and also to hug you and wipe your tears because some of, some of the exhibits are pretty intense. It's, it's a beautifully moving experience. And, and everywhere you go, you just kind of see that dynamic. And so people could give their time to this effort in an important way. And certainly the artifact donors, right? That's another type of philanthropy that we don't really think a lot about. But but this touched people in such a way that they went underneath the bed and back into the attic and, and in the back of the closet in the garage and they pulled out great great grandpa's violin when he was on the plantation and, and grandma's Bible. For, you know, I mean, it, oh, there's over 40,000 artifacts and some of them were procured through the more traditional ways, but, but a significant number of them were donated. Um, and so, again, to, to, to touch people in that way, right? I mean, this, let's face it, the Smithsonian is not thought of as kind of a, a black institution or one that's rooted in that community, right? And yet, it came to be seen as a place that's hospitable to this, and it's okay to give to, right? And so I think there's inspiration to draw from there. But it does, it does, it does challenge us to to push back and to rethink the things we've been taught and the traditional ways that we've done it. Restructuring campaigns um, in a more accessible way, rather than in a way that benefits our, the, our administration and overseeing of it, right? I'm um, thinking about ways to work with donors over time uh, to to bring in their gifts instead of expecting and only going for or focusing on the lump sum donor who can who can do it and move on um, all of those things really really will really challenge us and I know I know it's hard I, I know there there are a lot of campaign directors who are just not having that um, but but I think those are you, you have evidence there's, there's this beautiful building in DC that's evidence that it works right um, and, and that work continues and so I think there's a lot there are a lot of lessons to learn from that yeah it's a, it is an amazing testament uh, you know I've, I had the chance to visit there as well and really a really um, powerful and impressive uh, mm -hmm. uh, exhibits that are there. So um, uh, yeah, well, well, thanks. I appreciate that. We do have a couple of questions then from the, uh, from the audience that I wanted to turn to. Um, one asks uh, really about your giving and the way that Madam Walker and, and her uh, philosophy of uh, philanthropic giving um, had an influence on you and how you might approach uh, philanthropic giving. Yeah, no. So I, um, I, I think, you know, Madam Walker is the kind of donor that makes you feel like you can never do enough, right? You got to keep, what else can I give? What else can I do? But I'm very much tuned to this idea of education as philanthropy. That's an important part for me. Part of that comes from my HBCU experience. Um, part of that comes from my experience in the church. But again, the ways in which my elders, you know, invested in me, spoke 
spoke life into me, spoke good words into me, helped me catch a vision for myself. Um, I think those kinds of things are very important. And I don't, you know, belittle them or, or take them for granted. And when I got to Lincoln University and I'm surrounded by this faculty, I'm, you know, first time I'm just kind of all these African Americans and Africans with PhDs from, you know, all types of universities, the leading institutions around the world. And and they're there and they're just inspiring and and they're presenting, you know, this I was at a, I was at an institution that didn't need a, a, a VP for diversity, equity, and conclusion, right? Because we were already center and, and, and the curriculum and all was already aligned for us to see our true history and who we really are and how we can step into that, pick up the baton and continue on. And so very much that education is a big part of that. Um, and, and, and doing what doing what it can to, to help um, organizations and, and people. Um, you know, my mother is the, is the first philanthropist that, that, that I've ever known and generous to the core, not a millionaire at all, but uh, helps out so many people in so many different ways from driving senior citizens to their medical appointments to you know looking after running committees at church and those kinds of things so um, I, you know I, I strive to, to, to be worthy of that tradition yeah, yeah I still remember the speech you gave at graduation by tra by tradition or somehow uh, you know IU uh, Indiana University always puts graduation day on Mother's Day. <laughs> and so uh, Tyrone gave a speech tying together alma mater with his mother. And it was really uh, uh, quite, quite uh, inspirational. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, the HBCU experience that you had. And, and, and one of the um, audience members asked, you know, there, there obviously are other institutions that have um, had a more difficult experience with race and, uh, you know, um, wondering if you have some uh, understanding in terms of how Walker kind of dealt with exclusion and how, um, you know, in terms of coming to terms with that past and uh, thinking about, um, you know, the, the, um, the ways in which um, Walker might say, uh, let's figure out how we can, how we can make something better out of this. Yeah. Um, well, Madam Walker wasn't having it when when a, when a theater in Indianapolis, you know, tried to charge her more than it charged white patrons. She sued him. Uh, so she 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 fought back. And so uh, I think there's there's lessons there. But if you think about predominantly white institutions and and the experience of students of color and alumni of color, I think it's important that that institutions um, acknowledge any harm that has been caused and 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 be focused on on becoming a hospitable institution, one that grapples with its past. I, I actually have an article about this coming out in in case currents. Um, but it's important that, you know, alumni of color may have had a different experience. And the ones I've been interviewing and talking to, they just say, you know, the things may have been difficult in different ways, but it's also very important to recognize that many alumni of color, predominantly white institutions, are, are very proud of the education they earned from those institutions, and they want to be connected. They, they feel they deserve to be connected, and yet they remain frustrated that all too often the advancement offices are missing them, not engaging them, not sending materials that are relevant, or not sending messages that that resonate and are hosting events that that and you know you know make them want to come and so they they want to be seen they want to be heard and and there's there's quite a few who are you know some elbow their way to the table and try to push change and others um, are, are waiting for you to earn uh, their gift and earn their 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 respect again because of, of difficulties they had and so I I say um, it's it's important for for advancement and alumni relations folks to to step into that and and if you get a silence from black donors and black alumni and other alumni of color. Don't, don't take that as uh, permission to move on. Um, lean into it, ask why. Uh, why didn't they respond to your solicitation? Why didn't they come to your event? Why didn't they respond to this other outreach? There's something going on behind it and you need to figure that out and know. And, and, and sometimes people just need to know that they've been heard and understood um, so that they can move on together with you, um, help to make things better. Um, and sometimes, you know, you might need to get, you know, feel the heat a little bit. I know I've I had my fair share as an advancement officer uh, dealing with upset alums, uh, but um, I mean, this is this is vital, and I think this moment is is begging this question because alumni of color deserve all the the attention and engagement that the majority alumni do, but all too often they're not getting it. And so I think the advancement profession has to wrestle with that and grapple with that and work to change it. Because at the end of the day, you know, we do decide who we invite, we do decide who who makes the list and and who 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 we tend to focus on. And so we've got to diversify that. And those are things that 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 fundraisers can do as they walk. Well, you know, we're not walking into 
offices anymore right now, but, but you know, as you, as you decide who you're going to engage, you can go and look and decide to diversify that, even as you push and press your institution to go through broader institutional change regarding diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the things that um, sort of reminds me of, of the importance of your work, honestly, is also um, the notion, I think, for so many uh, development officers, it was easy enough for them to say when they didn't hear a response that, oh, you know, uh, by tradition, uh, African Americans don't give, uh, so we'll move on, right? And so your book um, sort of shows that by tradition, they, that, that is not at all the case, right? And so... Um, you know, and, and there have been, of course, other other uh, survey studies and the like that uh, showing showing this more contemporarily, and so um, so it is a real important. I appreciate your um, your addressing that. Um, let's see, I got another question coming in. Just let me uh, take a look here. Uh, so thank you for your research and discussion. You've highlighted how important uh, the value and goal of self reliance is to Black philanthropy. Yes, it seems that yet it seems that today's culture and younger generations have not latched on uh, to the self-help, self-reliance gospel, uh, the Booker T. Washington approach versus the uh, W. B. Du Bois uh, approach, um, as Madam Walker and older generations have. What do you think she might say to young people today? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know uh, if I would uh, agree with that assumption. I mean, uh, it's young people who were out in the streets last summer. Right. The activism is a part of this tradition. Right. It's not limited to money. It's using your whole self to push for change. Um, my, 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 my friend, uh, Ebony uh, Johnson Cooper down in D.C. with the Young Black and Giving Back Institute um, has a whole community of, of young and, and, and up and coming budding philanthropists of color um, who are engaged in their communities in many different ways. And so um, I, I think um, it's important to to, to look and see um, how uh, you know, each generation kind of comes to the struggle in their own way um, and interpret it in their own way. And, and I think we see, saw evidence of that with the way the Black Lives Matter movement has come to fruition um, in ways in which they sought to distinguish themselves from the traditional civil rights movement and, and, and embracing elements of it and, and shunning others, but trying to do something um, in, in, in a different way. Um, there was a turn towards mutual aid at the beginning of this pandemic, and we saw people in, in neighborhoods, particularly in, in New York City, right, talking about it, right, and but that you'd expect that, right? There's a whole lot of ethnic uh, neighborhoods where that's normal. That's what you do, right? And so the pandemic was just another chance to kind of continue to do what, what, what we do. It's funny, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who's from Grenada, and I was expecting Explaining to him giving circles, he hadn't heard the term before, and um, you know they, everybody puts money into a fund and then they collectively decide. He said, "Man, that's running the box." <laughs> he said, "We do that in Grenada. That's run the box. When somebody gets their their house burns down or they lose their job or they're struggling with the disease or or they have a need, you run the box and you give you collect your resources and you give it to them and you help them, you know, get through that get through that situation. So so these traditions are here. They've been part of communities for a long time. So um, I, I think you know I think you know." looking at, at the ways in which young people are coming to the struggle today. Um, it may not be ways that might be immediately recognizable to some of the older generations, or may not be in the way that those generations came into it. I think we do need to give them some of their space for them to, to explore and express that. And, and last, last summer, they certainly showed up and they're still there. Um, so um, I, I think we need to, you know, uh, that's how I would, I would look at that right now. Yeah, thanks. I, I actually was at a presentation earlier about uh, all the all the uh, freezers and fridges throughout uh, New York City. There were apparently 99 between the Bronx and uh, and uh, Washington Heights. So um, lots of community uh, coming together in, in that way as well. Um, you know, the um, one question we had about sort of comparative uh, from the time frame and the influence of uh, different individuals on each other. And so uh, one is uh, Annie Malone and and her influence on uh, Madam Walker, but I know in your book you talk about a couple of other networks that um, you know uh, developed at the time as well. I don't know if you want to talk more generally um, about Malone, but then other sort of mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, both entrepreneurs and philanthropists that uh, yeah. Madam Walker might have influenced. Yeah. So yeah. So 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 Sarah worked for Annie Malone. 
Um, and that was her entree into the beauty culture profession. Uh, the Poro company, um, um, you know, had products and, and she was an early um, sales agent for, for that company. And so that's her, that's her first exposure. Um, and, and, and so it's important to, to recognize that and understand that. Um, and, and um, when Madam starts selling her products, she was actually working for Annie Malone um, and they ended up becoming competitors. And, and there's some, some letters, you know, things in, in the archive where, you know, things, things became tense to them, but we don't really know the exact kinds of falling outs that they had, but um, you know, it, it, you know, that, coming out of, of, out of uh, Annie Malone's company was an important part of her story. There's another woman named Sarah Spencer Washington who um, is coming on the scene kind of as, as Madam Walker's kind of transition passing, um, uh, but the Apex Company, she's from Atlanta, Atlantic City. Uh, she moves out to the Midwest and the Apex Company um, you know, becomes another kind of household name and a, a branch of schools, just like Malone, just like Walker, big factory doing, you know, doing big things. Um, and so it's, it's, it's important to understand and the origins of Black beauty culture. This is happening between the, the gap between Avon and Mary Kay. So uh, it's important to kind of see that evolution. And in the 1950s, when Black beauty cultures, uh, beauticians got together and created a beauty hall of fame, it was Malone, Walker, and Washington were the first inductees um, to that. So they looked to these women as kind of founders, trailblazers for their, their field. So, um, and, uh, so again, uh, very much trying to put her in the context of her peers um, and, and, and seeing her in that lens. And so, that, that's that's an important part. And again, all the educators, all the club women, they, they, they were all engaged in the struggle. They were race women. That's what it meant to be a race woman, that you were dedicating yourself to the uplift of the race and using whatever your talents or your particular avenue was. For these women, it was business and beauty culture. For for Mary McLeod Bethune, it was education and then in, in government. And uh, Lucy Laney, I mean, you can run down the line. They're, they're all race women in this tradition. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the other uh, uh, other question that we received was actually also uh, was related to terminology and uh, the use of philanthropy, um, you know, which um, perhaps outside of Indiana University has more of a connotation of, of the wealthy uh, giving um, uh, than uh, than that gener more general um, giving. And so uh, wondering as well, you know, in, ter in terms of did you think about, well, there's mutual aid, there's maybe even solidarity, uh, charity, philanthropy. Uh, I'm, I, you know, other than perhaps that you teach at a school of philanthropy, were there were there other reasons why you landed on philanthropy as the term? <laughs> Yeah, um, because I, I wanted a way to kind of pull together the full spectrum of these activities, and and it seemed to be a good umbrella term to do that. Um, there's there's lots of things that have been written about Black women's political and social activism, um, and, and the great things that they've been doing with that historically down through the centuries. There's another literature on their community work and their racial uplift work. Now, racial uplift is a code word for, for philanthropy in this tradition, um, and there's even there's a smaller you know smaller literature about some of the fundraising and things that that Black women were doing. Uh, particularly during Walker's era, but I didn't feel like any of those um, gave access to to something a little bit larger. Because in in each of those instances, whether you're focusing on the activism, it's really them kind of you know trying to take action against the state. And and when when you focus on the community, it's it's kind of them trying to create these these services. And fundraising was often presented as kind of this necessary evil and something that you had to do. But but the term philanthropy, um, in my view, gave access to a notion of a moral imagination, why they were doing this, the spirit with which they brought to it, um, and, and the, the vision that they were trying to bring about. And so that that seemed to be different. And 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 also the the, the term is not foreign, you know, and I, I play around with this and I have some other other things that I'm working on that'll be coming out. But you know, Du Bois in 1909 called African Americans, he said, the, uh, uh, a few races are more instinctively philanthropic than the Negro. He's writing this at the height of Jim Crow, like that does not match with our picture, right? You know, and there's a whole story behind why he said that, that I, that I go into in this piece. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, another uh, black writer, Gertrude Moselle out of Philadelphia in 1894, calls Ida B. Wells the quintessential woman philanthropist in the country. And Ida B. Wells wasn't giving away money, she was an activist, she was a journalist, she was recording the scourge of lynch lynching and forcing America's attention onto the issue, right? And so it speaks to the diversity of the 
this tradition of diverse ways to give and, and the versatility of, of the label. So I think the people who saw themselves in this tradition of pushing back against Jim Crow, trying to give rise to, to liberation, uh, you know, uh, is, is where you find this activity. And so I, I'm, I, I offer this as a way to, to reclaim Black women already as doing philanthropic work. And that continues today from, again, the Young Black Giving Back Institute to, to August is Black Philanthropy Month. That's founded by three Black women. The Black Lives Matter movement founded by three Black women. Me Too movement founded by a Black woman. Um, you know, AVFI, uh, you know, the Association of Black Foundation Executives, the Women of Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy. This, this, it's still here. It's still alive and well. So I um, wanted to give voice to that. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that uh, explanation. And, and frankly, it's a great summation of the importance of your book, right? That it brings voice to those who haven't had voice, brings agency to those that we've seen as recipients and not as active uh, philanthropists. And so really uh, appreciate the fact that you've written this work and uh, that you continue to write in this, in this field, because we need, of course, more and more scholarship on this. Uh, this is uh, obviously a fantastic start to this uh, discussion, but it's gonna be one that's gotta continue and we'll continue with additional scholarship and additional um, you know, uh, advice from practice too, from the practitioner world. And so uh, really appreciate you spending the time with us today, uh, Tyrone. Um, you know, wonderful to, to see you and chat with you and um, you know, ex appreciate you explaining the many contributions of your book. So, um, Wanted to take a minute here to um, uh, thank uh, you, first off, Tyrone, for joining us. Uh, Want to thank the audience members, uh, especially um, want to acknowledge Ms. Bundles for joining us today. It was really uh, uh, okay. fantastic to see uh, she was able to, uh, <laughs> to make it. Um, and um, want to take a minute to thank all those people involved with planning, from Cindy Lott as the academic director, Francis Laviscourt as the deputy director, uh, Lonnie Ryan from our uh, nonprofit management uh, team and Liz Packard from the SPS events team. Uh, really appreciate all the work that went in. Many of you on uh, listening in are alumni. And so I hope you take the chance, uh, the opportunity to provide us feedback generally about our program, as well as um, the types of programming that we're doing. And so please do take the alumni survey. Um, I think that will appear here in the chat for you in a minute. And one last reminder that if this uh, discussion inspired you to want to learn more about Madam Walker, we do have in the chat a 30% discount code so you can go out and buy the book. It's a, a, a great read, um, certainly recommend it to you all. So 